Hello, everyone. I'm Asha Nayaswamy, and we're continuing our 9 a.m. Uh, fireside chats. So it's nice to be with you all. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master, Paramhansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, dearest friend, Swami Kriyananda, we offer our lives in service and devotion at your feet. Be with us as we navigate these unknown waters, living through the gifts of learning that you are giving us, that we may find our way in the light to the light and eventually to merge in the light and be one with Thee. Om. Peace. Amen. Our um, topic for today is who's pulling the strings anyway. But before I get to that one, I want to, I have to make a, a full disclosure here. I have quoted repeatedly this statement that I said I read in a letter of Master where he said the answer to hard times is to serve others. So someone naturally asked me what letter was that in. And so far I can't find it. So either I dreamt it or I just made it up or I did a little creative reading. I really don't know. I think the answer to hard times is to serve others. <laughs> But I'm not in a position now to absolutely state with the same unequivocal commitment I had for it that it was true. I mean, the reason I think it's true is because the purpose of everything is to help us to attain self-realization. And Swami did say, and I know he said this, um, it's in the Patanjali Yoga Sutra commentary, he said, the best way to overcome the ego is selfless service for others. So all suffering is caused by identification with the ego. So the solution to all hard times is selfless service. And certainly all of us who are housebound and uh, perhaps with too much time on our hands inclined to be nervous, um, thoughts of self and our own well-being are what make us uneasy. And as soon as we begin to concentrate on the welfare of others and even more, if we can find a way to dynamically put out energy to help others, then all of a sudden the entire focus shifts away from self into a greater reality. And two things happen. One, we are actually helping to alleviate suffering, which is a good thing. It earns us good karma and it's just a good thing to do. And the other is we're not thinking about ourselves anymore. One of my early uh, axioms that convinced me to get on the spiritual path, one of the ones that Vivekananda told me in his book, was don't think about yourself and you'll be happy. It sounds so simple, but it's true. Then there's a third, another point which Master said, the instrument is blessed by that which flows through it. So if we're facing hard times, and the very definition of hard would imply that we have somehow lost connection with the joy of God. And so anything we do that puts us back in touch with a greater reality brings the blessing of being an instrument. All of that is going to be the direct antidote. So even though I can't find exactly where I thought Master said what he said, nonetheless, I think the principle is true. So I had to say that before we started. Now, the idea for who's pulling the strings anyway, I have to offer over to my friend Shurjo. Shurjo and Narayani are in charge of our Mumbai Center, and they are a huge presence on the Internet right now. Um, they're, they're marvelously inspiring and delightful as human beings. So I'm giving them a, a, a plug here. You just go on the internet and look up Ananda Mumbai and you'll find them all over. Go on 
the internet and type in Ananda, and you can, I think you can go 24 hours a day now with somebody live streaming somewhere. But in any case, Shirja Narayani gave a brief satsang, a half hour satsang yesterday. Yes, I think it was a half hour. In any case, Shirjo started in a most interesting way. I had spoken to them personally a few days earlier when all of this came down. We often, we occasionally Skype together. And they were talking about, as they found themselves housebound and as just like, like all the Ananda centers, everybody's had to move their video streaming equipment into their residences out of our centers and churches so that uh, those of us who are doing this can do it without having to leave home and mostly without having to leave home. Actually, here in Palo Alto, we have two locations. We sometimes go to the church and we sometimes do from here. Um, and they were talking to me about this strange sense, strange because, uh, because you might not have anticipated that it would happen. The sense itself was not strange, but this, it, it was a, a delight and a surprise to discover themselves feeling extremely uplifted by the descent of what you would, would think of as something that would pull your energy down. On several of these broadcasts, I've had to say the same thing. This enormous sense of, of glorious, expansive energy that I just feel. And then I wake up and I think, I mean, I wake up from it and I think, this is not a time for celebration. But in, on some level, it, it feels like a great blessing even at, at the same time as the potential suffering of it um, is alarming. This morning, um, Anand and Kirtani led, and this is another um, suggestion for all of you, at 8 a.m. on Thursday morning, 8 a.m. California time, um, there's a 20-minute affirmation, uh, Warriors of the Light affirmation, and it's being led by different Ananda groups around the country, and this morning, around the world. This morning it was led from Assisi by Anand and Kirtani. And as, as I was sitting with them, I am a warrior of the light with the sword of faith in my hand, with the, with the love of God in my heart. I am a warrior of the light. There was a tremendous, I mean, we were hundreds of us. I think there were 800 people on the, on the um, live stream last week, and I'm sure there were many more this week. You could just feel this extraordinary power going out. And it, it was, yes, a, a war situation, a war of light and darkness situation, uh, motivated that movement. But the movement was its own reality. I am a warrior of the light. And there was this feeling of exaltation. I am a warrior of the light. You see, hard times are not sent to us to break our spirit. They're sent to us to build our spirit. They're sent to us to show us who we actually are. And once we experience for ourselves who and what I actually am, then life becomes an entirely different, um, it's a different journey than when one is sitting and concerned about what's going to be done to me and what's going to happen to me. I don't have to be a passive, a victim of this situation. I am a warrior of the light. I can go forward fighting my own delusions and helping, you know, bring others behind me by my courage and my, my commitment. Courage, bear in mind, is action taken whether you're afraid or not. So we have to realize that it isn't a question of being perfect in our understanding. It's just having a little more willpower to overcome our fear than the fear has to take our willpower away from us. And it... And <clears throat> Actually, we just have to come right up to the edge and then God reaches across and pulls you through. That's really how it feels. You just sort of stand there at the window and then he'll take you, but you have to get all the way to the window. So Shurjo was talking about how this felt and <clears throat> he put it in really simple ways. It's, he's, and here's how he commented. He said, the entire globe in a matter of virtually days has just been shifted the entire world has shifted, and, and every citizen virtually on the planet now has one, we're all focused on one reality, and to the best of our ability or our understanding, people are all trying to work in the same way to get to the same objective. He said, you know, no human mind 
and certainly no protein encased in fat, which we're calling a virus, has the power to influence consciousness like that. And Shurjo just said so simply, he said it's self-evident that Babaji is doing this. Babaji meaning that that avatar in, in Autobiography of a Yogi, Master talks about Babaji and Jesus together are very concerned about the direction of society. It's quite a paragraph. And they are together, two avatars, one with a body, because Babaji is an ever-living Himalayan yogi, one without a body, which is Jesus, who have been the, the avatars of East and West, who are now bringing the world into one reality. They have a plan. They have a plan for overcoming race war and hatred and bigotry and selfishness. They have a plan. So this has to be their plan. Now, of course, I wouldn't know how to transform the world and overcome race, hatred, and bigotry. I would have my idea that everybody would wake up in the morning and be nice. You know, it's like we all go to bed greedy and mean, and we all wake up in the morning and we're nice. <laughs> but unfortunately, there's an element of free will here for individuals, and there's also the karmic evolution of every jiva. So it just can't be transformed like that. Every individual, he himself and herself, has to awaken, has to awaken to where our own happiness lies. And the way God made this creation, every jiva gets a chance to explore. And the jiva is the best word for the individual spark of spirit. The English word is soul, but jiva is better. Because jiva is that unique individuality which is always present even once we, we attain God realization. So each jiva has the God-given opportunity to learn at its own pace and in its own way. And we choose planets where the mixture of light and darkness is the right balance, which also means that people with darker karma than those of you I'm sure I'm talking to here, because if you're watching or listening to this, you're a warrior of the light. And people with darker karma who are not interested in the light, they also are children of God, and they also get their turn. And they will come to a planet where they have an opportunity to express a certain amount of darkness. And we're on one of those planets. And we just chose to be on one of those planets. But Babaji is working with all of us because we're all his children. We're all children of God, and we're all working on this. And no power less than that could make this happen. Now, Yogananda occasionally made references to, to both his own actions and the actions of the Himalayan masters, is how I'm going to put it, because that's what he called it, masters in the Himalayas. The great masters of the world who have, given, have been given responsibility for this world. The organization that we see on the planet is a reflection of how creation is organized going up. You have your, your common worker bees, you know, you have your mid you have your mid management, you have your higher level management, you have those who are really in charge. And in in the path, in the, the last chapter, one of the last chapters, right after Master's passing in that book, in the new path, Swami talks about um, just because these books are so wonderful, in the new path. Swami talks about great spiritual families. And he talks about how this world is not really run by presidents and prime ministers and dictators and czars and all that. It's not run by those people. Those people are acting out their karma and then they become the instruments of global karma. And it's, it's actually interesting just to understand that. Master made two very interesting statements right after, you know, in regard to relatively recent events in his life. He said Hitler, as, as evil as his actions, as the consequence of his actions turned out to be, Hitler was the instrument of the karma of, of the countries involved and the peoples involved. But he, he, of course, he bore a great deal of responsibility and will suffer. I mean, will have to suffer in order to learn compassion, the compassion he didn't have. But he wasn't, as a master put it, and these are subtle points, personally responsible for what happened. And so the karma he got was bad, 
but not as bad as Stalin's karma. Because Master said that Stalin was personally responsible for all the evil that was perpetrated through Russia when he was in a position of leadership. He said that Stalin will suffer, I mean, this is quite a prediction, for 100,000 lifetimes for what he did because he was personally responsible. Hitler will suffer, but his, in fact, actually, you see, Hitler, when he first started, Master said, he had a lot of power, but it wasn't clear. He had both, he had both inclinations toward the dark and the light. And there was the possibility that Hitler's power might be used for good. And in 1935, when Master went to India, he went through Europe, he went to Germany, he tried very hard to meet Hitler. Isn't that interesting? And he wasn't able to make it happen because Master knew that there was the potential for Hitler to learn, but he didn't. He said, I'll go back even farther. I mean, these are just, these are the stories that Yogananda tells. He said in a past life, Hitler was Alexander the Great. In, on the side where, who were the victims of Alexander, they call him Alexander the Great Destroyer, but he was nonetheless great. When Alexander got to India, he apparently expressed a great deal of interest in yoga. And so what Master wanted to do is he wanted to try to reawaken that side of that jiva's incarnation. So, but he wasn't successful. You know, the destiny was too strong. The karma of everybody involved was too strong. So that's, that's part of it. Those, those are interesting parts of it. Now, during the course of the Second World War, and I'm not a student of history, but this is how I understand it. Hitler was a brilliant tactician in terms of his war, and he was just, as we all know, he was just rolling right over every country he stepped into within almost no time at all. He had conquered it, and that was you know, the terrifying aspect of, of being alive at that period of time, because you were just watching this madman just going across and instituting these draconian, you know, bar bar barbaric, evil policies. Um, but he had the capacity to win because he had developed that power. You see, you, you develop, even being evil, you often develop qualities that when you turn toward the light will enable you to go quickly to the light. So in some weird way, sometimes powerfully evil people are more advanced than, than well-intentioned people, but who haven't yet developed that kind of energy. I mean, there's so many things about the spiritual path that just break all our preconceptions. I think being housebound because there's an invisible enemy who could be lurking in the body of anybody you know is a good way to get us to think deep, deeply and think differently. So that's what we're trying to do here. So even so, even though the, the power they had was being used, could be being used badly, as soon as they realize the error of their ways, they can turn it toward good. The story of Milarepa, yogi, um, Tibet's greatest yogi, a great read, that book. Milarepa was a very powerful black mu magician who destroyed his enemies. At the, his, his family had been cheated out of their property and instigated by his mother. He learned black magic and destroyed, literally destroyed the people who had, had stolen from them. But then Milarepa realized this was not a good use of his willpower. And so he just took all that power and he turned it toward good and then became a very great yogi because, well, as Ramakrishna put it at, at one point, he knew how to worship. He was worshiping the devil, but when he began to worship God, he knew how to worship. He didn't have to learn how to do it. He just had to redirect it. So Hitler was very, very good at being bad. And, but it's, at a certain point, he opened the battle on two fronts. And I, as I understand it, he also, he went to war also in Russia. And he simply divided his forces. And he divided his forces beyond what he should have done. And that weakened him. And that allowed, finally, for him to be defeated. Now, here's the interesting part. Master said that the yogis in the Himalayas put the thought into Hitler's mind to divide his forces. In other words, they were watching and they were seeing that this dark force was getting too much power, but they couldn't interfere directly, necessarily. I mean, they couldn't just change the karma of everyone involved because they're all God's children. Every, 
every jiva has the God-given free will to find its own destiny. So if, if jivas are behaving badly, but the, the God wants to help us learn our lessons and become good, he's, uh, God is not indifferent to the evil that we're creating. He's not indifferent to the suffering that evil is causing. He's helping the suffering people to rise above their suffering also. You see, it's all a, a very different drama. The external circumstances are not an end in themselves. They're the college classroom in which we get to study and take the exam and see how we do and then get to take the course over if we failed and try it again. And Divine Mother is helping us all equally, appropriately, according to our karma, which also includes every so often for Stalin, 100,000 lifetimes of suffering, if that's, what, if that's what's required for the jiva to learn. But, but what Master also said, which is interesting, you see the Himalayan yogis, you know, these are the real premiers and presidents of the world, not whoever, not the leader of the United Nations. The leader of the United Nations is working for the Masters. This is the good news, friends. Who's really pulling the strings here? Okay. The Himalayan masters had to work through Hitler's karma, meaning he had to, re the idea was projected to him. This is how Swami explained it to me. It's Swami talking about himself. The people who, work as, who worked as leaders of Ananda, including myself, at a distance from Swamiji, Swami said he would literally, he would project his thoughts to us. You know, because thoughts are instantaneous. They're beyond time and space. He would project ideas and thoughts to us. And if we were attuning, if we were attuned to the vibration of what that thought was, and if it resonated with us, then we would receive it. I mean, haven't you all experienced an idea that pops into your head? Because thoughts are universal. And there are these benign, and also evil, forces that are projecting thoughts. And whatever we're in tune with, we catch. Now, the Himalayan masters were wise enough to know <clears throat> that Hitler had become, had become, was arrogant. And he had been so victorious, he believed he was undefeatable. So that they, they played on that arrogance and caused him to make a tactical mistake that he, he, would, he should have known better. But they were able to play on his arrogance and then cause him to do that. And then the Allies eventually were able to defeat Hitler because Hitler had been weakened by that action. So that's, there's one example. Here's another, also of war, interestingly. In, uh, in the 1950s, uh, after the Second World War, there was another war, which was the Korean War. And that was, under, uh, that was instigated from America, and that was uh, to defend Korea against this wave of, of communist aggression that was coming up. The masters are not indifferent to communism. The they, master felt that communism was a great evil because it was completely materialistic, absolutely atheistic. There is no reality but the material world. Master thought that communism was a great threat and that, again, I'm not a student of history, but whatever the force was that was coming up um, through Korea could have gone from there, if they had managed to conquer Korea, it would have continued to spread very far across the world. So Yogananda said that he put the thought into President Truman's mind that America should go to war and stop the communist aggression. That's just how, that's how my master put it. I put the thought in Truman's mind. So Truman receives this inspiration and He's thinking about these issues, so he's in tune with the idea. It resonates with his own values, and so he absorbs the idea, then he adds his own creative commitment to it, and it's acted out. But who's pulling the strings? I'll, I mean, here's another small example. Apparently, Yogananda, um, he also said that he put the idea into the mind of the, of the medical research scientists, the idea of the antihistamine. Now, when I, this didn't mean anything to me, but when Dr. Peter at Ananda heard Swami say that, the Master said he put the thought into the researcher's mind, whatever it was required to discover the antihistamine. Dr. Peter said that opened the door to a vast array of useful medicines. 
that it was it was a key idea that no one had thought of yet, and then there was the idea. It was the breakthrough that was required. Master just said, I put the idea into the researcher's mind. We have Steve Jobs, who is who is to a large extent responsible for the fact that I'm able to sit here and talk to you, or certainly was hugely influential in making this possible. He was deeply devoted to Yogananda. He didn't affiliate himself, he didn't live the life that I lived. But, he, but as, as he often said, the only book on his iPad was Autobiography of a Yogi, and he, he read it um, judiciously, assiduously, at least once every year. And, and who knows how many of the world-changing ideas taking us into Dwapara were put into his mind by Master. Steve didn't talk that way, but he had an awful lot of good ideas, and thoughts are universal not individual. And there he was, connected to one of the masters. So who's pulling the strings anyway? So that's where Shurjo just started out of a kind of intuitive feeling that nothing of this magnitude, well, I mean, you, you go, nothing of, nothing of no magnitude, as Swami often said, uh, to, be <clears throat> to be omnipresent not only means that you're present in the, in the vastness of infinity, it means that you're also completely present in the tiniest atom. In, in infinite, inf, in, infinite implies infinitesimal. So absolutely nothing happens that isn't part of this greater whole. But when the entire globe is shifted just like that, this is not human agency. This is not president of any country or the governor of any state or the, any doctor. It none, and it's just not possible. There's too much power here. But this is part of Jesus and Babaji's deep concern about the direction of civilization. And also, look how much concern there has been about what's going on in the world. We have this woman, uh, Greta, who's just come up and just sort of marching around the planet, shaking her finger at everyone, saying, you know, what do you think you're doing? You're, you're so out of tune with the world, and where do you think this is going? And you have all these politicians just maneuvering for positions in power and calling each other names. And it's just, for refined people, it's rather a depressing time. And the only thing that I say to myself, and I say it repeatedly, I chose to incarnate at this particular time. It's early Dwapara Yuga. What did you expect? I say that to myself. What did you expect? How dare you be outraged at this point? You knew what you were getting into. So yes, this is it. Because warriors of light, we have a job to do. It's a very important transition for the planet. And what we do as warriors of the light, you see, this is not a, a battle between a virus and human cells. This is not a battle between um, you know, the, the country of, of where this thing started and the countries who are mad at that country now. This is not a battle between people who have food and don't have food, although it may manifest that way. This is a battle between light and dark. And the light and dark is not the specific events. The light and dark is, I am part of a greater reality and I will be a warrior of light with the sword of faith in my hand, with the love of God in my heart. That is who I will be. And in being that, from my core, there will radiate out these forces of light. And these forces of light Will be, will be felt, will be, will be received. And insofar as they're received, then that jiva will just turn a little bit more to the light. And if we all, all of us, see now we're in one big story. If we all just turn a little bit more to the light. Oh, I like not being quite so pressured to earn so much money. I like the fact that who cares what I'm wearing now. I like the fact that I get to see my children <clears throat> for more than 15 minutes a day. I like the fact that it's quiet enough to hear the birds. You know, how much do I need anyway? What is the purpose of my life after all? You know, who is pulling the strings here? And how can I attune myself with where this is trying to go rather than where I thought I wanted to go? What is trying to happen here? What is its message for me? And how can I lift myself into the light and be an instrument of that light 
to all. God bless you.